And it is an incredibly nice thing to come to a place where a decade after I left, I saw patients who look great. And they were treated with various biologics, some of them on trial, some of them not. And 10 years ago, I never would have thought in my wildest dreams that significant numbers of patients would be alive and well 10 years hence. And we're in a new era. Uh, as I've told each one of the patients that I've seen, all of whom I remember well, which is great. I guess this is still working. Um, I, I think we're in a new era, as Larry pointed out, and we have lots of new drugs. And I'll just remind you of what that famous philosopher Frank Sinatra said, the best is yet to come. So there are many new drugs coming up the pike. We have very good drugs. I think there have been something like seven melanoma approvals in the last five years. There'll be another seven in the next five years, so we're doing terrifically. And it's just a pleasure to be here. And it makes my day to see someone alive 10 years later. And uh, maybe I'm a little weird or old-fashioned, but I get a great pleasure out of returning somebody to the workforce who has metastatic melanoma. You theoretically cure them or put them in remission, and then they go back to work and do what they like to do. And that's, that's the greatest pleasure of my life. So I always show disclosures. I apologize for showing this. I have a lot of fingers and a lot of pies. Um, so let's talk about melanoma. Um, the genetics of cancer is a burgeoning field that really only took off perhaps in the last 15 years. And it was, I think, in 2002, there was a, an article in, a, in Nature, and it said that uh, there were lots of these mutations in different tumors. And if this thing works, I'll show you. Oh, probably not. But if you look up at the top, you'll see that there were many genetic changes or mutations, right? So that's an alteration in the, in the genetic code, the instructions of the cell in the tumor. Not in you, not in the patient, but in the tumor. And there was one gene, it was called BRAF. In that gene, you had lots of mutations in lots of different tumors. And it turns out in melanoma, it was something called a driver. What's a driver? Well, as you can imagine, it, if it's mutated, it pushes the cell along to become abnormal. It proliferates, it grows, it spreads, and it could kill the host. So why? Well, if you deliberately mutated it in a normal cell, the cell became a tumor cell, just like a melanoma cell. And if you got rid of it, if you removed it, and there are various ways of doing that in the lab, the cells weren't malignant. So there's pretty good evidence that having a mutation in that gene is bad news. And in fact, if you looked at the maybe 45% of patients who had that mutation in their tumor, that genetic change, they tended to do a little more poorly than those who didn't. So what did that provoke? A huge effort over the last 10, 15 years to come up with drugs to sort of block it. Because as you can imagine, if you could block the driver, you would kill the tumor cell. And that's a good idea, and there have been two BRAF inhibitors as well as a couple of MEK inhibitors, and you'll see why BRAF and MEK go together in a minute, over the last five years, and these are very good drugs. And even though we hear lots about immunotherapy, uh, these are actually excellent drugs. We call them targeted drugs because theoretically they should only hit the mutation, and your normal cells don't have the mutation, so theoretically your normal cells should be left alone. And it turns out there are other mutations. So in skin melanoma, the BRAF, and there's this other thing called NRAS, they're the most frequent ones, maybe 50% for one, maybe 20% for the other. And it turns out that some types of melanomas, because remember, not all melanomas are due to the skin. Some melanomas pop up in sun-damaged skin. Some pop up in the eye. Some pop up in the mucous membrane. So there are different types of melanoma. But the most common ones are in the skin, and the most common ones are in sun-damaged skin because it's pretty much the sun that's associated with causing melanoma. So you get the BRAF and the NRAS mutations in, um, uh, in areas where you tend to have uh, l lack of chronic sun damage. And then there's another mutation. It's called KIT. And there it's a whole variety of mutations. That's more common in the non-sun damaged skin, like the mucous membranes, those sorts of things. And the BRAF, the NRAS, and the KIT are mutually exclusive, so maybe if you add them all together, it might add up to 70% of all the patients with melanoma. So it's what we call a target. And if it's a target, you might be able to make a drug to kill it. And if you kill it, you might cure melanoma. And again, BRAF mutations, bizarrely enough, are more common in women. It's also more common if you're 20 years old, your melanoma is almost always going to be BRAF mutated. If you're my age, your melanoma is probably not going to be BRAF mutated. 
go figure. So, uh, and it varies with the type of sun damage. So the sun does certain things to, the, to uh, encourage the development of melanoma. It also encourages the development of certain types of mutations. So, a lot of effort went into developing drugs to block this BRAF mutation, to block the, it's actually not the mutation, it's the protein that is encoded by that gene. And it's just a protein, it has some normal functions, but when it's mutated, the cell gets out of control. So if you look here, on the left-hand side, it's something we call a waterfall plot. It's a great name because basically, when the line goes down, the tumor shrinks. When the line goes up, the tumor grows. As you can see, almost every patient has a line that goes down when they're treated with this drug. And this drug was called vemorafenib. It was the first BRAF inhibitor. And if you look at the right, it shows two curves. On the, uh, the, the, the vertical axis, it's the likelihood of progressing with more cancer. So I sure as heck would rather be on the red line than the white line. And the red line is the drug, and the white line is chemotherapy which 10 years ago, as some of you may remember, we actually used fairly frequently. I don't know about Omid, but I haven't used chemotherapy probably in a year or two, thank God. It's, eh, he's used a little chemo, but thank God we don't have to use chemotherapy anymore. At any rate, this was the first evidence that you could truly benefit patients with a targeted drug in melanoma. And another drug came along the next year. It looks exactly the same. It looks as if these are superimposable. This one was called dubrafenib. And again, same kind of trial. It was what we call a phase three trial. Phase three trial is when you do a head-to-head -head comparison. You get 300, 500, 800 patients, and a computer flips a coin, and you either get chemotherapy in this particular trial or the drug. And as you can see, that waterfall plot shows almost every line going down. Almost every patient had some shrinkage. And I sure as heck would rather be on the red line than the white line because the white line's chemo. Now, interestingly, this uh, was not this study, but the study before it was the subject of a New York Times article. Some of you may have seen this. It was a while ago. It was probably five or six years ago. And it was about the ethics of randomizing a patient to chemotherapy when everybody kind of assumed that chemotherapy wouldn't work. Today, you would never, ever do that. We are so lucky in that virtually every phase three trial done as its reference arm, as the control, contains a drug that does something good. In those days, those were the last trials that contained a control arm where all of us knew it was probably not going to work. Was that ethical? Well, if you didn't know the outcome of the red line, yeah, I guess it was ethical, but to be honest, I decided not to do the trial. Uh, we actually were lucky we had better things to do. But this was an important trial, and it really definitively showed in two different drugs clearly benefited patients with melanoma. And this just shows the likelihood of progressing. The survival was also a lot longer. So that was good, and that was back in 2011, 2012, two drugs got approved. Was it the be-all and end-all? Well, not exactly. If you look at the red line, as you go out like to a year, most of the patients will eventually progress. And if you progress with melanoma and you don't have other options, you ain't going to do well. So people scratched their heads and said, what can we do? So I apologize for the complicated nature of this slide, but what it says is, if you look where it says 50% on the left, in the cell there's a cascade. Everybody knows what a cascade is. It's like a, something binds at the surface of the tumor cell. What that something is, we don't know, some growth factor. It sets off a cascade. One protein gets activated, which then finds the next protein. The next protein gets activated, then it activates the next protein, and so on down the chain. It's like a snowball rolling down the hill, except there are multiple snowballs. It goes from RAS to RAF to MEC to ERK. Sounds like a baseball thing. Sounds like tinkers to Evers to chance. But at any rate, in this cascade, you can block the cascade. So what's the analogy? Okay, here's my analogy. There's a thief. The thief robs a bank. He gets away with it. He drives down the road, he's trying to get away from the cops. He goes down the highway, and the cops are clever. They hear about him, and up the road, in front of him, they lay the spikes across the road, and they block the road with the police cars. That's BRAF inhibition. You have this, this, this cascade, this thing that's traveling down a, a pathway, and you block the pathway, and it works fairly well. 50% of the patients have it. The response rate's probably 50%. The problem is, the thief's not stupid. Well, the thief is stupid, but the, st the thief is clever. The thief is clever. The thief says, well, I see up the road the spikes, but I'm going to get off the road. I'm going to go across the open field, bypass the spikes, and get back on the highway and escape. Okay, well, the thief is going to escape. So what you do is you don't just 
block it at one location, let's go back, you block it at two locations. Because if you block it where it says 50% of DRAC, and then you block it where it says MEC down the, down the path, you're much more likely to kill the cell. In the same way, if the cops lay the spikes across the road at one place and then they block every exit upstream and downstream, he ain't going anywhere. He's trapped. So that's what happens when you mix the drugs together that block this, this cascade at different points along the cascade. It's like getting that thief by not only laying the spikes, but blocking his ability to get off at any exit so the thief is trapped. And there are various cascades in the cell. This is just one of them. If you look up at the top, it says KIT. KIT is another gene. If it binds certain proteins, it can cause proliferation. And if you block mutated KIT, you can benefit the cell. If you block the BRAF, that's the light blue, you can benefit patients. Down at the bottom is ERK. That's kind of like the final common pathway. If you block ERK, and those are experimental drugs, you can also kill the tumor cells. So we have all these different ways of blocking this cascade. So we're all trying to capture the thief, and there are many ways to capture the thief. So look at all the drugs. We have vemorafenib and dabrafenib. We have trametinib and cobametinib. So you can see they block at different ways along that pathway. And then you have ERK inhibitors down at the bottom. And all these things, all the things that we're trying to block lead to one thing, proliferation, survival, and invasion. Those are all bad things. We do not want the cancer cells to survive. We do not want them to grow and proliferate. And we sure as heck don't want them to invade and spread. So there are various options that we now have that we didn't have before to try to kill the tumor cells. So how does it all work? So is blocking, is laying the spikes across the road and blocking the exits better than just laying the spikes? Absolutely. Yes, the response rate, that is the likelihood of shrinkage, the freedom from progression, and the survival, as I'll show you in a minute, are clearly better when you put the drugs together than if you use one drug alone. Now, what usually happens when you add drugs together in our field? Well, ask any of your docs. You know, usually you get more side effects. The weird thing about this combination was you actually improved the toxicity. It's like the only time in recorded medical history that putting drugs together in oncology reduced the side effects. Because when you give the BRAF inhibitor, I told you it was a targeted drug. That means it's like targeted to the tumor and shouldn't affect the normal cells. It actually does affect the normal cells. It's called paradoxical activation. So the patients, when they get the BRAF inhibitor alone, get papillomas, like these little skin tags. They get little precancerous lesions. And actually, you can get, a, you can get skin cancer. Not melanoma, but squamous type cancer. So again, it's one of the few cancer drugs that induces new cancers. In the big picture, it's a good drug, but I, if I were a patient, I'd be pretty disconcerted to have this little skin cancer pop up on my face. And it's not one cancer, it could be 10 cancers, and they all need to be removed. But when you give the MEK inhibitor, it suppresses the paradoxical activation. So if you do the two drugs together, you almost never see skin cancers, and many of the rashes and other skin manifestations go away. It doesn't go to zero, but it goes almost to zero. And it's actually pretty damn impressive. On the flip side, you also get other side effects. Anyone who's ever been on these drugs will know that you get fevers. And the fevers are weird. You can get, you know, on Friday evening you can feel fine. And then on Saturday morning you wake up and you feel terrible. You're fatigued. You have a fever of 103. And you feel miserable. And then you take some steroids and it all goes away, which suggests it's an immune reaction. But this is not an immune drug. And we still don't know how that works. And then you'll do fine. You'll take the drugs whatever, twice a day for the BRAF drug, once a day for the MEK drug. Three months later, boom, same thing happens like clockwork. And this is one of the weirder mysteries of our field. On the other hand, uh, if that's what keeps you alive, that's what keeps you alive. And it's probably worth it to have fevers every two months if it's a drug that's prolonging survival. So the standard of care for the BRAF mutated patient, especially the one, obviously they have to have the mutation. If you don't have the mutation, it's a waste of time. So for the half of patients who have the mutation, this combination is a standard of care. Not necessarily the standard of care, but it is a standard of care. And it definitely works, and it works better than just the BRAF drug, because here, look at the red box. It shows the rate of shrinkage. So all you have to look at is that red box, and in bold letters it says the percentage of patients who had tumor shrinkage. Here's a big randomized trial, 700 patients. Half of them got an active drug the BRAF inhibitor of half got this combo. 
we call it dabrafenib and trametinib. 66% response rate versus only 53 for the single drug alone. Obviously, it's better. I mean, 350 patients per group is a big number of patients. This is a very reliable result. And if you look at the survival, ah, you, know, if you tell me which curve would you rather be on. I'd rather be on the dark blue curve than the aqua curve any day. So if you look at the survival, the difference at two years is pretty darn significant. There's lots of patients, very reliable. So this led to the approval of the combination a couple of years back in preference to the single drug. And actually now there's another combination. It's called vemurafenib and cobimetinib, and, and I'll show you the information. It looks almost exactly the same. So the patients are doing better. Survival is prolonged. But the question is, what happens five, six, seven years out? And the answer is there probably is somewhat of a plateau for these patients. So if you look at, and this is longer term survival, you're out four years at the end on this red curve, kind of looks like there's a plateau on the curve. And the urban legend, as I'll show you, was that when you give these drugs, you get a rapid response rate, but most of the patients will progress and die. Not necessarily. It looks like there is a plateau. And if you look at further survival curves, and you're going out now uh, out to three, four years, and you look at lots of patients, I mean hundreds and hundreds of patients, it looks like, and these are different trials of the top ones are all the combination. The bottom one is just the single drug, so that's going to be the worst curve. So this is survival, the likelihood of being alive, and the straight line is 50%. Kind of looks like as you go out to four years, there's a plateau. It's below 50%. It's maybe 30%, 40%, but it looks like maybe those patients are going to be cured. And I actually have bunches of patients that are five years out that I treated when I was at Moffitt in Tampa, since we didn't have these drugs when I was in L.A. 10 years ago. The Moffitt patients, a bunch of them are still alive and doing well. And many of them got these drugs, and then if they progressed, they got immunologic drugs, and then they're still doing well. So many of these patients will be alive, and the urban legend that everybody dies if they get BRAF mech is not true. And if you look at the other combination, it confirms that the drugs give benefit. Again, would you rather be on the blue curve or the red curve? I would obviously rather be on the blue curve, no question about it. That's the combo, and the single drug that blocks that BRAF is on that red curve. So clear benefit. The FDA agreed. They unanimously voted, yes, we're going to approve this combination. And this combination had a similar interesting suppression of the side effects of just the one drug. So again, the other, now it's the second time in the history of oncology that putting drugs together actually reduced some of the side effects. Although the side effect profile of this combination is a little different than the other combination that was approved a little bit earlier. But all that's good news. It says that we're getting better and better and better. We went from a single drug to doublets, and now, actually now we're into triplets, as you'll hear. And again, the problem is, though, admittedly the majority of patients, their tumor will eventually develop what we call resistance, meaning the tumor will resist the effect of this BRAF or the BRAF mech drugs, and the tumor will just start growing whether the drugs are in the body or not. So that's what we call resistance. And the urban legend is that you get a quick response. I showed you the waterfall plot. Almost everybody had shrinkage. Boom. And then within six months to 12 months, everybody's going to progress. Not exactly true, because we call this thing the tail on the curve. So if you get the tail on the curve, which I think I showed you a couple of slides back, those are probably the cured patients, and that's a good thing. But admittedly, most of the patients will progress. And it turns out that the patients who start out with the lowest disease burden and have the low LDH, which is a chemical that sort of is a marker for the amount of disease in your body, those patients do very well. And many of them probably get cured. Just look at the red line. The red line is all the way at the top. And those guys do incredibly well. And those are the patients who have the least burden of disease. So the urban legend was always that if you had a very little burden of disease, you should get the immune therapy because it'll work better. Mm, not necessarily true. So the good news is there are multiple options. If you have this mutation and you have a low disease burden, you may not need immunotherapy, which can have some serious side effects. You could do very well with the BRAF and the MEC, or you could do very well with the immunologic therapy, this combination you'll hear about of uh, ipilimumab and nivolumab. But that has a pretty high toxicity rate. But this gives you some hope that maybe some of those patients out at the end of the curve are cured. And we never used to use the C word. 
10 years ago, as I told my patients that I met this morning, I would meet with patients and say, you know, we have a lot of drugs that we can use. We have lots of trials. We will always look to put you on a trial. And we do our best to prolong survival. And they'll say, well, can you cure me? And I say, you know, what does cure mean? I don't, I don't think we know that we can do that. I mean, if cure means you die at the age of 99 with your boots on and have an autopsy showing no melanoma in your body, I don't think I can, I can't guarantee that. But today, when we talk to patients, we actually will use the cure word. We'll say, it is possible that if you receive these drugs in five to 10 years, you will be alive without disease and you may well be cured. Can I guarantee that? No, still can't guarantee it. But now we actually broach the topic. And the other weird thing, by the way, which nobody talks about is, you need more melanoma docs because more melanoma patients are alive, so they obviously have to come to the doctor to be seen. So the projections that they make at academic medical centers for how many people to hire in the old days were off. So instead of two docs, you need three docs, which is, I guess that's good. We're not complaining. But it's hilarious. Um, and it became apparent when I was finishing in Los Angeles and we treated patients with ipilimumab in the earliest, some of the, I was involved with some of the earliest trials. And they kept coming back and coming back and coming back. And all of a sudden you look at the chart and you say, huh, gee, 24 months, shit, that's unbelievable. And then 27 months, 36, whatever. And that's when you begin to realize as an investigational oncologist that something's working. I mean, it's also good when you have that magic moment when in the old days we used to have um, uh, films. And you may remember, those of you old enough, you would have a, a light box in the office and the person would put the film up of the CAT scan, the pre and the post, and you would have multiple nodules. And then you'd put them in the pre-CAT scan or x-ray, whatever it was, and then you would put up the post and they'd be gone. And you'd go like this, say, whoa, it's the right, and then you would peer at, is it the right patient? Is it the right number? <laughs> and that's, that was, the, that was the, 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 the dream scene that you always wished for, that the patient would come in who had been very sick, and eight weeks later, 12 weeks later, they'd come in, bopping in, they'd look great, and you'd have a light box in the office, put up the scans, and the tumors would be gone. And now, to be honest, 15 years ago, it didn't happen that much. But now it happens a lot. We're almost... I don't know what my colleagues think, but we're almost spoiled because we see this a fair amount and it's the aha moment. And that's, among other things, that's what makes my day and I suspect it makes their days too. So these two drugs together do a very good job, but many of the patients become, we call it resistant. So at the end of the day, after a year, it stops working. So what are we going to do about it? Well, there are a couple of ways you can approach it. You could target genes or gene products, proteins, that are responsible for the resistance. Because the resistance doesn't just appear, other things happen in the cell. The cell, cancer cells are not stupid, they're very clever. They are adaptable. They will adapt their expression of genes so that they can overcome the effects of the drug. They resist. So it's like this living organism that has the continuous ability to adapt. And so it's like a, a chess game. It's point counterpoint. You're always trying to get one step ahead of the tumor, and it's not easy. I showed you that there was a cascade. If the cell becomes resistant, you can block the cascade, but you can develop something called a bypass pathway. So it's like the thief going down the road. He'll go across the field and find another road that's parallel to the existing road. That's a bypass. And if that happens now, you have to have another drug to block the bypass pathway. Or... What if there's a different driver of the tumor growth? What if it's a BRAF mutated patient who has some other mutation and you block BRAF and that's done, now you have to block the other pathway? Or what if you added immunologic therapy to the targeted therapy? Immune therapy works, great drugs, some of them are toxic, some of them aren't. They can cause patients to have long-term survival. What if you put them together? Maybe be at least additive, maybe even better. So I, I'm not gonna harp on this, it just shows this is incredibly complicated. It just shows there are like 10 different pathways in the cell that could either be bypass pathways or alternative drivers of growth of the tumor cell. So just blocking one of them, which is the one in the middle, the BRAF, which has all those drugs listed, which are all letters and numbers, may not be enough. You may have to block some of the others. So what if you targeted 
mutated altered genes that played a role in resistance to BRAF inhibition. So I'm just going to tell you very quickly about trials that have come up in the last year. So again, this is a trial where you get a BRAF and a MEK inhibitor, and as soon as you become resistant, meaning as soon as the tumor starts growing, because most of the patients respond. So very simply, it's a, it's a phase two study. In the first part, you get the BRAF and the MEK. And then when you progress, a biopsy is done and a genetic assessment is made on the spot. I mean, not literally on the spot. It takes about a week or two to do. And if there's a new mutation that's responsible for causing the growth, a drug is chosen that could potentially block that mutation. And you have uh, a, a group of drugs. You have a PI3 kinase inhibitor, a CMET inhibitor, uh, a CDK4-6 inhibitor. And again, the initial response rate was pretty good. Three-quarters of the patients responded and have stayed there. But a bunch of patients have become resistant, and they've all gone on. And I, I can't show the data because of ethical issues. It's not yet presented. But suffice it to say, a bunch of the patients who have been resistant to the initial combination now responded to the second drug because they didn't have the mutation before. They got treated with the BRAF MEK inhibitors. The mutation then was selected for, and then that mutation was blocked. So those folks would be, will benefit. But think of how complicated that is. That means you have to do a biopsy to look at what genetic changes are going on in the tumor on a continuous basis. Ultimately, we'll do a blood test because you may not realize this. Almost anyone who has melanoma has at one point had circulating cells in their blood, individual cells. And they may not ever in your lifetime take root and cause a tumor, but they're there. So what you do is we'll be taking a blood test at intervals and looking at the genetic makeup of what's in the blood. And you'll get an early warning if a new mutation develops, boom, you'll go on to the next treatment. But think about how difficult and complicated that is. I mean, that's really space age stuff. So that's the first attempt to, it's, uh, I would call this an adaptive approach, because you're constantly changing things depending on the genetic makeup of the tumor. And the problem with tumors is the genetic makeup changes. So you're always, tr the tumor's trying to stay one step ahead of you, and you're, as you as the oncologist are trying to stay one step ahead of the tumor, and it's not easy. So what about different drivers? Okay, it turns out at the top, I told you about the cascade, well, the cascade goes downhill. It goes from RAS to RAF to MEC to ERK. The thing is, it keeps going downhill. It doesn't end there. It goes into the nucleus. So that happens outside the nucleus of the cell. And then in the nucleus, you get these other things that CCND1, CDK4-6, these are chemicals that help the DNA of the cell divide. So if you could block things all the way down at the end of the cascade, that might be a good thing. So once again, it's an idea, the thief is going down the road, you're going to lay the spikes across, and you're going to block, and, but he has a destination. He's looking for a safe house in Baltimore. You're going to lock down the safe house in Baltimore, and you're going to block the, uh, the beltway, That's how he, or Interstate 95, that's how he's going to get to Baltimore. So, but he's smart, he's going to get off 95, and he's going to go on the BW Parkway. These are real places, by the way. And you let him go down the Baltimore-Washington Parkway, but you station guards around the house in Baltimore, and that's how you're going to catch him. So that's the equivalent of this. The BRAF or the MEK drug blocks the cascade. That's blocking I-95. But down at the bottom, the CDK4 inhibitor is going to surround the safe house, so you'll capture him when he gets to his safe house. Does it work? Yeah, look at this. I told you about the waterfall plots. These are the initial data. There will be a follow-up at our meeting in June. But it looks pretty darn good. This is not a very toxic regimen. And this is a combination of two drugs. And there are two different schedules. So there are all these different multicolored lines. You'll see most of the lines go down. So this is very encouraging. And it gives yet another opportunity in a scenario where, say, you have no BRAF mutation. Let's say you have an NRAS mutation where these drugs together may work. So that's looking promising. OK, and then there's another such drug. Another, It's called a CDK4 inhibitor, and it just has a number. It's P1446A05. And again, this was presented at our meeting last year. We'll probably hear more about it at our June meeting. That's the big meeting in Chicago where all the oncologists get together. Um, so again, this was a very small trial. Um, they had BRAF inhibitor patients. So if you just look at this bullet point, all three of the patients who had uh, were BRAF naive responded to the treatment, so that's pretty encouraging. And again, this is a BRAF drug with 
this CDK4 inhibitor in patients who have a BRAF mutation. So again, instead of BRAF MEK, now you go BRAF with the CDK4 inhibitor. Let's say you start out with BRAF MEK, you might progress, stop, rest, and then go on to this. So it's yet another way of getting around that thief trying to go up I-95 to escape. What about the bypass pathways? Well, we did a trial at Moffitt, the institution I just left. It turns out that there's a protein in the cell that has lots of uh, normal functions. It's called a chaperone. What's a chaperone? Well, a chaperone is a person who guides another person to go somewhere. So it turns out all of us in our cells have chaperone proteins. They carry proteins from one place to the other. Some of them are absolutely necessary and you can't do without them. Some of them aren't. One of the ones that's not absolutely necessary is called um, an HSP90. That's its name. HSP means heat shock protein. Why? Because when you heat up the cell, it goes up. But it's a normal component of the cell, but it's dispensable. The problem is when you are getting treated with these BRAF drugs and you become resistant, this component plays a prominent role. So if you could kill it or block it, you might kill the resistance. So what we did at Moffitt is we took the BRAF inhibitor, Vemorafenib, and it turned out there is a HSP90 inhibitor that's been developed commercially, which alone really didn't do very much. But we put them together. And we were given the drug for free, which was nice, by the company that made it, which was very disappointed because they had this fantasy that their drug would function alone as an anti-cancer drug. Didn't work. We put them together in a combination strategy. And the first data will be reported at our meeting in June. But the response rate looked pretty good. 71% response rate, there were some complete responses, and two of the patients who had a partial response then went on to have surgery and they had no tumor. So that's pretty impressive. And the survival, meaning when we say median survival, that means the point at which half the patients are alive and half are not, was 33 months, which is good. Now, small numbers, but it looked very promising. So this is an attempt to kill a a substance that's partly responsible for the resistance to the BRAF inhibition. You'll hear more about this. At Moffitt, they're now doing the BRAF plus the MEK plus this HSP90 inhibitor. So very impressive. Doesn't add side effects. It's an easy drug to, to tolerate, and it's great. So lastly, what about targeting the immune system and this BRAF MEK mechanism? Okay, well, here's a picture. It says there are many reasons why you might want to do it. The tumor cells up at the top, and if you look at the bottom, when you give the BRAF and the MEK drugs, it increases those little yellow dots. The little yellow dots are the things that the T cells, the immune cells, can recognize. So that's good. And it turns out that while the MEK drug alone can screw up the immune system, when you add the BRAF and the MEK together, it actually can activate the immune system. So those two drugs could activate your immune cells and it could increase the ability of the immune system to recognize the tumor target. Sounds like a great deal, right? So you'd want to give BRAF or BRAF MEK with these immune drugs like ipilimumab or nivolumab or pembrolizumab. Well, it's not that simple. Uh, when you gave ipilimumab, which many of you in the room I know have received, <clears throat> and then added the target th targeted therapy, what happened? Well, there's a reason why we do what we call phase one trials. Phase one trial is when you start out very carefully, small numbers of patients, and you increase the doses, or you decide you're going to give a fixed dose of two different drugs, and you very carefully do this in patients and closely observe them. You draw lots of blood samples, keep an eye on them. What happened? Ten patients were treated where they combined vemorafenib and ipilimumab. Ipilimumab is the immune drug, vemorafenib is the BRAF drug. Six of the ten had horrendous liver toxicity. They all got better. Nobody died. But there's, an, there's a message here that we ain't going to be able to combine these drugs safely because ipilimumab is a drug that can cause unusual and unexpected side effects. You give it with the BRAF inhibitor, forget it. It's not going to happen. So again, when you gave vemorafenib with a PD-L1 antibody, different drug, um, you again had liver side effects. So what they did is they had to stagger the, the dosing. They had to give one drug, then the other, because if you gave them both together simultaneously, you had a lot of bad liver effects. And again, when you gave the dibrafenib, trametinib, the BRAF MEK drugs that were approved that worked very well with ipilimumab, bowel perforation, colitis, colonic inflammation, 
That's going nowhere. So you could just give the BRAF inhibitor with ipilimumab, although you have to be very, very careful. And a lot of those patients also got liver toxicity. So ipilimumab with the targeted therapy ain't happening. However, if you give these PD-1 or PD-L1 drugs, which are the new drugs that just got approved, in fact, this week there were two approvals. One of them was the PD-1 drug was approved for Hodgkin's disease. The PD-L1 drug, very similar, was approved for bladder cancer. So two drug approvals in one week, not bad. So this was a drug which is now has a new name called Dervalimab. <clears throat> in those days, it was called Medi-4736, which is a stupid name. So this was, com <laughs> it really, it was combined, we, we hate those names. It was combined with the BRAF and the MEC drugs, so that's the brafinib and trametinib at the standard doses. So they could not find any severe toxicity. That's the good news. So for the first time, putting the drugs together, no severe toxicity. When we say no maximal tolerated dose was identified, the maximal tolerated dose is when you can't keep going, you can't keep going up in the dose, uh, you, you've hit a wall. So there was really no wall identified. There were some side effects, but they weren't horrendous. And the response rate was pretty good. 76%, 16 out of 21 patients, and most of these are ongoing. So the key is with the BRAF and the MEC alone, most of the patients progress by a year. So what has to happen here is you've got to wait. You've got to be patient. When you put these three drugs together, if after a year or two most of the patients don't progress, you know you've got a winner. That means the toxicity is not severe, and you've got at least additive, if not better, effectiveness. And then now we're thinking of doing a triplet. And lastly, uh, there's been another study. This was presented by Tony Rebus, uh, uh, preliminary data a couple of months ago, and now he's going to present it in June at our big meeting. So you'll see it says 2016. This was just published on Wednesday. We got the abstracts of our meeting from June. Small study where pembrolizumab, which is a PD-1 antibody that I know some of you are actually actively getting, with dibrafidum and trametinib in those who have the BRAF mutation. Small number of patients treated, only 15, but look at the response rate. 60%, uh, not bad, and a couple of the patients just kind of stabilized. So they did very well. And again, 15 patients doesn't prove anything, but after 115 patients, if this holds up, it's going to look at least as if there's some additivity, and the side effects, again, were not too bad at all. So what do we conclude? Well, we talked about how 10 years ago, 15 years ago, mutations, it was appreciated that mutations in melanoma drove a significant number of the melanomas, was responsible for their growth, proliferation, and spread. If you block it, it can benefit patients. If you block that pathway that leads to the growth and spread in two locations, that's BRAF MEC, it's better than just BRAF. However, most patients who receive these drugs, even though they benefit, and even though some of them may be cured, most patients will eventually progress and we need new approaches. So. Right now, what goes on in our business and what some of these guys are involved with is using drugs to block other pathways, blocking the bypass pathways, and again, adding immune stimulation to this targeted therapy. So again, I think these are going to bear fruit. You're going to see triple combinations hopefully getting approved in the future. And my only concern, which I'll end with, is if you do BRAF MEC, I think it's like $16,000 a month. So if you stay on it for a year, that's a lot of money. That's like 200000 bucks for the year. If you add nivolumab or pembrolizumab, that's 12500 a month. That's 150000 So are they going to add the cost? In other words, you know, there's only so much. You know, the United States, by the way, still has the greatest GDP in the world. It's easily the richest country in the world, but there's only so much money in the world. So somewhere there's got to be some give, and I think the pharmaceutical companies realize this, and I'm, I'm hoping that we won't break the bank by doing all these great things that have happened in the last decade. So I think my time is up, and I thank you.